Okay, John, can you yep. say it's disabled? Uh, okay. Bear with me. Uh, can you share now? There we go. Perfect. Okay, so can you guys see my screen now? Yeah, fine. Thank you. So uh, thank you all for joining us. Um, I hope that what I have to say is of uh, some interest. So uh, John basically asked me to provide a bit of information for you on the journey that I've taken to get where I am. And so basically to start off with, um, I did all my undergrad in the UK and then I got given the opportunity to come and work with um, Prof Nope and Prof Michael Lambert at the University of Cape Town. And we started something that was uh, quite quite unique at the time. Um, I guess that most sports science concentrates on endurance sports, and I had a passion for team sports. So we started off with the more physiological um, side of things, uh, looking at why do we do testing, what can testing tell us, and then how do we use that to actually improve our training methods? So we know that uh, visual feedback uh, can be used to improve our understanding, but we're not really sure of um, the reliability, the efficacy of the techniques that we've been using. So um, all of this was pre-GPS. So one of my studies, I set uh, two cameras up and I give you the uh, location they were on the, the stand and facing the field. And here we go, there's pre GPS. So my study in this took a stopwatch, a video camera, and a field map. And every 15 seconds, I would make a note of where this player, particular player was. And yes, I did every one of the uh, 10 outfield players at the time, and uh, yeah, every 15 seconds, and I used two pitch maps for um, start the whole game. So one half on one field, one half on the other. So this, just to give you an idea, um, was sports code back in version seven. We're now, if you're con currently up to date, is version 12. Um, so if you have a look at the, um, the little booklet down here, you can see that we actually had to work on a dongle rather than all this um, modern online information, starting installing the CD. Um, and I would take the system down to the, the field and the players would then view the video that I'd taken so that they could make changes um, at the half-time interval. So now, that was more the, the theory side of it. Um, and then through the, the theoretical side, I was given an opportunity to work with um, uh, the provincial team. And because I'm based in um, Cape Town at the time, I worked with Western Province. Um, and I don't know if you can see carefully, but I actually am in the top photo and I'm photo bombing right at the back filming. So the next um, year that I did, um, I still didn't make the team photo because I obviously was filming, but the, um, one of the final years I worked with Western Province, I actually made the team photo, which as an analyst is, is quite a big thing. So through this experience, um, I was also given the opportunity to work with um, SA Hockey, and that was in 2002, and yeah, we, we worked up in, um, in Joburg on the very first uh, Champions Challenge. And it was quite interesting to see um, the different colors of the athletes coming in. Uh, you had those that had been exposed to the, the summer and you've got those white um, Russian players that haven't got any exposure to the sun and you could see the difference. So yeah, we, we played um, that, that tournament. Um, I've also had the amazing opportunity to work with um, Western Province uh, cricket um, and uh, South African cricket. 
So South African cricket in one of their World Cup preparations did a little bit of work with um, the coach Eric Simon, and it's it's amazing actually how very simple just uh, play slow motion stop can change a whole coach's perspective of um, what they're actually viewing and can give a huge insight um, into the way that they they're uh, trying to coach the players that they're that they're working with. Um, yeah, so I don't know um, who actually remembers, but um, I was part of the um, ICC uh, testing protocol when they had all of these discussions about the um, the bent and the straight arm issues. Uh, so you know that's another opportunity that I've had working with um, Prof Mike Lambert and um, uh, Prof Tim Noakes. So my journey into rugby, um, I guess. It sort of started to happen by by chance um, because the Sports Science Institute, which is where the University of Cape Town department was, it was based in the same building as um, South African rugby. So if you walk up and down the stairs or you take a lift or something, the chances are that you will bump into a national coach of some sport, um, but specifically rugby. We also had a high performance department, which was more concentrating on actually working with athletes rather than on the research that we had. So they had links with some of the national coaches. Um, and I got asked by Chester Williams uh, back in 2003 to do just a very simple uh, time motion analysis to tell him what the um, work to rest ratios were in sevens rugby because they're really, um, I think there's one paper uh, I think it was in 1998, and that's the only paper that was published for um, about five or six years. So they really did nothing on um, Seven's rugby at that point. So any information I could give him uh, was valuable to him. Now, at the same time, um, I got given the opportunity to work alongside Jake White. Um, I think. What I was able to offer was real-time analysis. Um, so I was able to take the camera straight to the training ground and give him feedback um, straight away. Uh, obviously, um, many years ago, but the principle of filming training sessions really wasn't um, really wasn't used. So the information that I could give him, we would feedback in a team session, and we started to adopt a more player-led approach. So instead of Jake standing up there and saying, this is what he wanted and et cetera, et cetera, he'd open the floor up to the players and say, guys, what do you see? How can we make it better? Now, probably the, uh, I call him my mentor, probably one of the most um, outstanding coaches that I've had the privilege of working with is Paul True. I started working with him when he became the seventh coach. Um, I've got numerous stories working with him which I'll um, elaborate on um, in the next couple of slides. Um, and then I worked with Eric Saul, a couple of training camps, um, once again providing video footage on the training sessions, which they weren't really doing. Um, and then through working with Eric, you get to meet um, other national coaches who want to see what's happening in their junior age group. So met up with Peter de Villiers, and it was actually uh, quite funny. I don't know whether you say the wrong place at the wrong time or the right place at the right time, but I ended up sitting in on his technical interview um, before he got the Springbok job. So I was sitting there nervously making sure that I didn't press the wrong button and I screw up his interview so that he didn't get the job. Um, yeah, and then... Um, so Paul True moved on from South African rugby and um, moved to Kenya for a couple of seasons. Um, and I was given the opportunity to work in a similar capacity um, alongside him. So that, that's been my, um, I guess, my working in the, in the male rugby area. Um, now, my first experience of working with uh, women's rugby came in 2006. Uh, this is the first time that South Africa had qualified for the um, World Cup. 
and so we had the privilege of going to Canada. Um, the, the World Cup was pretty much what you'd expect. Um, amazing rugby, amazing experience. Um, however, what maybe is the start of my better understanding of team sports comes when you take a look at why we didn't achieve the performances that we were capable of. And so what I mean by that is you've, you've got the, the team um, playing, which is, I'm going to call it a very European um, type of environment. You know, you've got the hotels, you've got the, the food, you've got the transport, you've got the um, going to matches, playing your matches, etc. Now, the players that I worked with, they found, well, I'll go back a step. Some of them actually hadn't been on an airplane before. And you're expecting them to go from their normal um, environment into something that is totally, totally different. Something, a shopping mall to them blew them away. Um, so I, I think this is where I started to realize that we've got to start embracing what it is to be a team. What, it, what are the uh, constituent components? And after one of our matches, um, we, we took the, the ladies and we took them for what we consider a braai, uh, you call it a barbecue, but that is South African culture. So we had an evening of South African culture and that changed the whole environment. It gave the players meaning, uh, it allowed them to relax, it took them away from the tension of being in an environment that they were just uncomfortable with. And I think if we could run that whole thing again with those same players, that either we needed to prepare them better by going on tours and getting them used to uh, hotel living, getting them used to um, not needing to go to shopping malls because of the novelty of it, we would have done better. Or had we you know, embrace the culture of the team better and um, had a lot more relaxed, um, I'm not sure whether it's team building, but I think it's just relaxation environment where um, the players could just be South African. Um, I think we would have done a lot better. And just to give you another idea, this team has never seen snow before. Um, you know, I don't know whether you see that as a sort of a unique perspective, but coming from Africa, um, you know, they're, they're like little children. They've never seen something before, so they wanted to embrace it. So we were taken to the Rocky Mountains, and there we are. We got our experience of snow. So that's a huge learning curve for me, and I'm not being critical of any of the coaching that was done. I just think that as a, a group, had we understand understood our dynamics better, we could have got more from our players. So now working with Full True, which has been an amazing experience. So the ground um, we've got here um, is Port Elizabeth. Um, sorry, the next one's Port Elizabeth is George. Um, so Paul is a real revolutionary, um, inspiring, um, not afraid to take chances, not afraid to uh, go looking for new ways to improve. Um, and through our discussions, um, he realized that he wanted to get video footage of matches. Um, now, it wasn't always possible because at that time, um, not all games were televised. So we had to make a plan ourselves. Now, it's quite interesting. So the first year that I spent at George, um, I think it was 2004, I was actually at a hotel room with a, a feed from the, uh, the TV and I was doing all the analysis and the players were coming backwards and forwards from the, um, the field. We then decided that that was too disruptive and took too much out of the players. So Paul, through his connection, got the video feed from the TV truck. So I was standing outside um, at the TV truck with my computer and having it all plugged in. Now, that won't seem that unusual, 
to, to many of you, but I think you have to realize that um, World Rugby or the IRB then were not providing this service to the analysts at all. So Paul had access to this through his, his connections, but nobody else had access to it. And just to highlight um, one of the times that I was at Twickenham, I was there, I'd just been given my Springbok tracksuit. I was sitting there in the press box because there wasn't an analysis facility. And I got told by the tournament organizer that I wasn't supposed to be there, even though it had been officially cleared. So the agreement was that I would turn my tracksuit inside out and I would sit there quietly, not saying boo to a goose. And that's how uh, World Rugby, IRB, they started to realize that this was something that they couldn't stop. Um, through Paul's uh, stubbornness, if you, if you like, or just through his um, innovation, World Rugby have moved forward. And, you know, just to show you how slow things were, at the Melbourne 2006 Commonwealth Games, we were not allowed to have tripods to film. So according to their regulations, we had to stand for 15 minutes with our camera like this and get a stable view. Now, there were a couple of us that um, we took a chance, we took our tripods in and we stood where nobody would be able to stand behind us. But that's how it all started with Seven's Rugby, uh, being the privilege of having many, many conversations with Paul. In fact, I used to get phone calls um, because Dubai was played on a Friday and a Saturday, I think. I used to get phone calls during work on Fridays saying, what happened, what did you see, et cetera, et cetera, um, so that I could give him feedback um, after one of his England matches or, or whatever. I had so many in-depth conversations with Paul. Um, yeah, it was, it was just phenomenal. But we were doing this. I was based in Cape Town, and he could be wherever around the world. Now, when Paul moved to uh, Kenya, the tournament moved to Port Elizabeth. Um, which is this stadium, and a magnificent stadium that was used for the uh, 2010 World Cup in South Africa. I was also given the opportunity to work with um, Paul in the Commonwealth Games. However, instead of being at the event like I was in Melbourne, I did everything uh, remotely. So I would send him all the information based on roughly using the same video and uh, give him feedback from Cape Town to Glasgow. Um, uh, just an amazing time, obviously extremely stressful because if you lose that video feed through a technical issue, um, you're in a lot of trouble and there's not a lot you can do to get it back. But those were some of the things that Paul was willing to experiment with and um, yeah, that basically created the environment for um, for what we, we currently have, and I'll show you that just later on. But through working with Paul and um, some of the questions that he generated, I wanted to be able to assist him in a, a very unique way. Um, my knowledge of rugby has grown significantly over the last um, X many years, but it's not what I would say as a rugby coach. And I've deliberately not gone that route because I think that I can add value with my um, analysis um, type of thinking, um, but using it in a different way. So what I did was I just had a look at the amount of time that things took to happen. So when you had um, possession and you didn't score points, or you had possession where you did score points, was there a difference in the length of time taken for those different events? So you can see that we found things like 52% of uh, ball in play, and each team would have about 27%, 28% of match time. There's a difference in the amount of time it takes um, to score points. And those sort of things can then build up into um, relevant training suggestions. So, for example, here, we can see that there are no points scored until after five seconds of possession. 
and then if the, you carry on with the graph, there are no points scored for movements that last longer than 60 seconds. So that has uh, implications on how you construct your defense. You can have a very rapid defense that try and get the ball immediately from your opposition. If that doesn't happen, then you fall back, you form your lines, and you're disciplined, and you know that after a minute, if you keep your um, defensive discipline, you will not concede a try. Um, so those sort of things that you know Paul actually used, and um, I think I don't think there's that much disagreement that South Africa have been extremely successful defensively in the World Seven series for I don't know, let's say 10, 15 years. So it's sort of those sort of things that I wanted to add to enhance his knowledge of the game, but not um, so complimenting rather than um, you know teaching him how to coach. So when uh, he moved to Kenya, he brought the Kenyan guys over to um, Cape Town for a training session, and we started using drones. And this was back in 2013, and I'm not sure that the use of drone footage had really taken off at that point over here. It's widely used now. Um, so just to give you an example. So that's the, you know, how we were using the drones then. Um, I don't think it's really significantly changed that much. Um, but I'll refer back to that particular footage uh, later on when I come back to the um, to the women's rugby. Um, now sevens is pretty much a family affair, um, and so my family has to get involved. And this is the little guy, uh, three years old, and he's obviously starting to get rugby potential and being coached by the best. So he might be one to watch for the future. Who knows? Okay, so this is now one of the facilities um, that was in Port Elizabeth that is being used by uh, the analyst. Now, from a TV truck with one computer, these guys, they have uh, two angles provided by them now, and they have the referee's uh, feed. Um, so you can see that Every single guy's team has a minimum of one computer, if not two. Um, with the, the experience now in Cape Town that we just re we had last year, um, that room is probably twice the size now because you've got the men's and the women's um, tournaments being played at the same time. So it's a lot bigger and it's extremely um, high pressure. But it's just amazing when you think of how everything started from absolutely nothing to what the guys have got now. So there we go with the, the Kenyan guys. Um, the video footage that I was taking in that room back there would then be passed to them and they would be having a look at it um, in between their matches. Uh, you've also got to realize with Sevens Rugby that the amount of feedback that you can provide is extremely lim limited because of the, the time delay between the different matches. So you've got to be extremely concise in the information that you're providing and it has got to be 100% directed to the game plan that has been discussed um, rather than sort of trying new things throughout. So between my time with um, Paul, and my current um, appointment at Sevens, um, South African Rugby, I had plenty of time to have a think and start asking slightly different questions. So what actually does it take to be a seven series champion? Do you have to win all of your matches or do you have to be selective or are there certain key times in the season where you have to be successful? These questions, there just wasn't the information out there. So by just using very simple um, normalization, because the tournaments had changed um, in terms of the 
numbers of teams, the numbers of core teams, the numbers of tournaments, I had to adjust everything. So having a look at the total points, I think you would say, um, I think there's a maximum of 22 points that you can get for winning on the, on the guy circuit. So to finish top of the table in the men's series, you need to get just over 80% of the 22 times 10 points available. And if we have a look here, to win the, the series, you have to make a good start to the, um, to the year. Um, because if you have, haven't got 50% of those points available by halfway through the season, you're not really likely to be able to win the, the series. You're likely to come second or third, but you're not likely to win it. So these pointers, you know, they can give you a lot of information with regards to your planning, with regards to your rehab, with regards to your team selection. So, you know, uh, South Africa, New Zealand, Australia, especially because of the, um, the Super Rugby, they will select players that have got extensive sevens experience but will disappear off into the super rugby competition because they know they need to make that strong start at the beginning of the season. So here we have just a brief summary of, okay, so we know what it takes in terms of the number of um, log points that you've got to get. What does it mean in terms of actually the number of points scored or points conceded? So, I took from the very beginning of the um, seventh uh, circuit to 2014-15, uh, and you can see that the number of tournaments change, the number of teams that participate changed, and the number of core teams have changed. And with all of those, obviously, there's a variation in number of matches. But it was quite interesting to note that for points scored, there's definitely clusters um, between the beginning of the tournament and the 2005-06 season. But if you also notice that the tournament starts to become more stable from, from that point on. So the things that we notice there is that you could predict with, let's say, 95% confidence, seven out of the eight teams that would make the top um, tier of the, of the tournament. So you've got the um, cup and then you've got the bowl tournament. So the top eight finishing teams would go into the cup and you've got the bottom that would go into the bowl competition. So I could pretty much predict who was going to be in the top flight um, up until 2005. When the tournament started to become more stable, and with the introduction of the Olympic status, um, those things started becoming more complicated. And you could start to say that probably about 12 to 13 teams, core teams could win a tournament at any point during the, um, during the tournament. So a lot has changed due to the investment and the higher profile of Sevens Rugby. Um, which has made the game the exciting, um, challenging, um, knife edge uh, kind of, not sure whether carnival is quite the right word, but that sort of um, atmosphere that we currently have. So another question that we could start having a look at is, are there changes across the different tournaments? Do we have to have a look at selecting different players based on where we're actually going to be playing? Um, and as you can see, you know, South Africa has held the tournament at different venues. Um, Uruguay is not in the competition anymore. Um, so there's various different things that you have to look at. But then you also have the complication that the scores and things have changed between the different seasons. So the methodology that you use to determine whether there's a difference between the different venues is um, even more complicated. I have found that they're differences, but I don't know how relevant they are to date because um, yeah, well, I haven't included uh, the more stable tournament that's 
um, format of the series that's been going on um, in the last sort of four or five years. So that's been my sevens journey, predominantly with the men's side. And during that time, the women's sevens team uh, qualified to um, spend a season on the World Series tournament. And that brought with it a huge dramatic shift in um, SA rugby. We had, of last season, we had eight contracted full-time professional national women's players. And I think if you have a look at um, South African sport, there are no other professional athletes at national level. They might be at their club level or their provincial level, but there's certainly not any centrally contracted players. And so this year, I've been given the privilege of working with both uh, Paul Delport and um, Stanley Robenheimer. And my portfolio is the women's sevens and the women's 15 in preparation for any tournament um, that is coming up. Now, with the women, we were hoping to uh, represent um, ourselves at the uh, World Series qualifier in March, but um, obviously COVID has um, put a stop to that or put it on hold. And with the women's team, we're in preparation for next year's World Cup. So there's an awful lot of work to be done um, for both teams. So with the seven teams, as I mentioned, we've got professional full-time contracted players and we've got 14 of them. Those players are available for the, the 15, um, but obviously six, 16 of them, sorry, 14 of them doesn't make up a full uh, Springbok women's 15 squad. So let's just concentrate on the journey. Um, this is where we are privileged to be based. It's in Stellenbosch. Um, it's a facility that has been designed specifically for athletes. So we've got a whole series of um, rooms here that the players uh, stay in. They've got um, obviously the bed, there's a little kitchen and things like that. But they've got access to the swimming pool. I think it's the 20, 25 meter. They've got access to uh, gym facilities uh, with a free weight um, and the cardio um, equipment. Uh, I don't know whether you can see here, but that's an anti-gravity treadmill. So uh, we're, we're catering for all aspects, looking at not only high performance, um, but also injury and rehab um, and getting back to, um, to top performance. We share these facilities with one of the local schools, um, which is Poor Ruth, and they have an indoor center, as well as their outdoor fields that we train on. So here's just a quick view. So these, sorry, these are the, the fields that we play on. Uh, I don't think the view is uh, too bad, that we have to endure every day. And then we've got the indoor training facility. Um, I don't know, or whether people will have thought about it, but the indoor training facility is extremely useful um, in the summer, not just because of the heat, but because of pollen and hay fever. So, you know, rolling along the floor like the rugby players have to to mimic some of the, the training sessions um, and match demand um, can bring on hay fever, which we go into the indoor facility and that is greatly reduced. Just something that, um, you know, most people don't consider. So I'll just give you a bit of a view. Um, this is our weekly schedule. It's fairly consistent, but I'll show you a, a couple of weeks. So we have medical. This is non-negotiable. Um, we've got a, an on-site doctor who evaluates all of the players in different ways um, at the beginning of the week. If she's not happy with um, how they are, whether it's, um, uh, illness or whether it's injury, she will not let them train. We then go into a meeting session where the players say this is what they want to achieve for the week. Um, and then we start preparing with um, prehab, which is run by our strength and conditioning and our physio, so that the players with injuries um, or have long term injuries are warmed up and ready for the sessions that we have. 
we will then have um, an hour to 45 minute uh, training sessions, lunch, uh, gym sessions, and then on-field conditioning. These are sessions, um, this program was set up in preparation for the um, World Qualifier. So very similar on Tuesdays um, and Wednesdays is the players general day off. But what we did um, in preparation is we had a captain session where we would take them to the um, to Kutzenberg, which is the, the rugby facility just up the road from us where the tournament was being played. And so the players got to experience the different grass um, surfaces, um, you know, just how the, the field felt so that they were better mentally prepared as well as um, had a little bit of game time. Um, on the field before the tournament. Um, so as you can see, we had two video sessions a week, and what we um, what we started to develop this season is we started making it very much the player's responsibility what was going to be the construct of these video sessions. The purpose of that is the most obvious thing is that us as management, as coaches, we cannot go on the field. So we can only disseminate a certain amount of information. But if the players haven't understood it, haven't um, absorbed it, um, so that they can go on the field and make the decisions that we've uh, designed for them, then really it's, it's not very um, productive. So what we did is we divided the group, uh, the, the team into different groups and they were each given different parts of the game to analyze, and they would give us a five minute maximum feedback on this is how we want to play, these are the things we've got to look for, and so everyone would then be clear exactly on what their roles and responsibilities were. So whether that was from a training session, the feedback, or whether that was from a match, it would follow the same kind of um, information. So the things that I've learned is you've got to embrace the background of all of your players and you've got to enable them to understand the game plan that they're going to be playing. So those are my two key things going forward. Just another training session. So as you can see, they follow pretty much the same plan. Okay, so this is what we do on uh, match day. So you have a look here that if we've got a, a local tournament, then I take the footage, I have a wide angle, and I have a close-up footage. The reason that we tend to use this type of setup rather than a drone setup is because at this stage in the player's development, we actually need them to see what's going on. It's not help, that helpful to have the camera so high up that all you can see is the player's position. They actually need to see the consequence of their skill execution. I think with the seven players, we are moving more towards the wide angle and just the drone footage. But that has been probably about a, a two season um, learning curve. So, be aware of not providing technology just for the sake of providing technology. Provide it so that it actually is going to be useful to the players that you're working with. So preparing for Cape Town 7, it was an absolutely amazing time. But what we were able to do is we were able to take footage um, supplied by World Rugby and we had footage from the Glendale tournament, which was played in October, and the Dubai tournament, which was played in the week immediately beforehand. And so using that, we were able to compile databases on all of the opposition that we were going to be playing. So now my responsibility um, for planning the way ahead is to use this type of database footage and expand it more to try and ask the question, why do teams that win the qualifier 
bounced up and down between the World Series. So what is it? What is it in their style of play that enables them to win a qualifying tournament, yet isn't effective when they go on to the World Series? So those are the types of questions that I'm looking at now, uh, specifically with the sevens. Um, so I think, or at least I hope that the message that is coming across is that I'm working on a very much um, backwards and forwards type of relationship between looking at performance and conducting research. So I don't perceive that they're anything different. I think you have to convey a message that is un scientifically understood so that it has value and has um, some form of rigor to it, but it has to be conveyed in such a way that all of the players can take that knowledge and put it out there on the field. I, uh, my kind of analogy is um, that I go into a meeting, I present the information, and I actually want the players to come out of the, in the, the meeting telling me that they've had this just this amazing idea, and that amazing idea is exactly what I've presented to them. So, you know, it, there's an awful lot of work that you put in behind the scenes that they will never see. But if they can come out with one piece of information that will transform their performance, then that's what gives you me the energy to be able to to carry on behind the scenes and conduct all of this work. So just to give you a couple of highlights, um, here is the team having won the Africa Cup. Um, yeah, it's success in a in a veiled way. Um, that was the tournament qualifier for the um, Olympics as well. Now, unfortunately, due to uh, political situations within South African um, sports, although we won the Africa Cup, we didn't qualify to go to the Olympics. That's a different story, but you know that, that's how success can be one of the biggest failures. Um, but that's just one of the things that we have to, to deal with within South African sports. And here is a team who's just been announced to play in the Cape Town Seven. I was fortunate enough to be able to travel with the team to Cape Town. Um, in Tunisia, in the Africa Cup, I uh, actually worked from, from Stellenbosch and I sent them live information. The only problem that we had there is because they didn't have the internet to actually be able to pick up the information that I had. So technical challenges, but um, we were over, able to overcome them in Cape Town. An, an amazing picture. The first time ever that we've had the men and women uh, play on the same uh, field. Um, first time the tournament's been in Cape Town. So quite a momentous um, photograph here and certainly blessed to be part of it. Uh, women's team and men's team together. So an amazing experience. But I think you know, one of the main highlights, and I think they'll all agree, looking at their faces running out of the tunnel, is at home for the first time in front of your own crowd. The uh, reception was enormous, and the players were lapping up every minute of it. So that has been uh, the majority of my seventh journey. Now, my work with the, the 15s has been a lot less because I was only appointed this year. We're conducting very similar type of work with the um, the 15s that we are with the sevens. Only the starting point is a lot um, lower, just simply because we haven't had an analyst to be able to produce the information. So there's the the video-based feedback and then the written reports that we're putting in, having a look at the basic structures of the of the games that they're playing so that we can get an idea of um, how to construct a training um, session. So just to give you an idea of some of the challenges that we are being faced with, I don't know if you can see this picture clearly. This is one of our players and this is exactly where she lives in a very rural area. Something as simple and taken for granted as a skipping rope, she doesn't have. This is her skipping rope. 
if you read this section here, she made it by um, weaving grass together. She doesn't have weight, so she uses rock, using two litre bottles as weight. So the amount of drive that these players have to be able to reproduce as much as they can is absolutely phenomenal. Uh, you, have, you can't take anything away from them. Being faced in these situations and still having the impetus to lift those weights, to want to play on a, on a world um, on a world stage, is just absolutely phenomenal. And I think what I just want to show you is those are some of the things that we have to contend with, or maybe embrace is probably a better term. To take those things away, like we did in 2006, is destructive. And taking here, watching the video, she says, this feeling right here is what brings us together as a team and a nation. Then we know we are one family with one goal. It is an absolutely amazing experience to be in South Africa when South Africa do well in sports because the whole country comes alive. We experienced that when Sia Khaleesi lifted the World Cup. I don't remember having that feeling being based in the UK all of those years um, before I came over here. So it is extremely special if we embrace it and allow South Africans to be South Africans. So let me just play this clip for you. So that just shows you a bit of the culture that we need to embrace. Um, and certainly, that is how we're going to get the best of our players. So I think I'm going to end there um, and hand it back to, to John. Um, and I hope that it's given you guys some, some information on how to deal with um, analysis, working with players who have a completely bit different background to, to where you're from. No, thank, thank you very much, Michelle, and, and really, really fascinating and on a number of uh, aspects that, you, that you've touched on. And, and I've, I've, I've written down a, a whole page of notes, so I've got some questions in. Um, I can see there's a couple of um, questions put in the chat box, but whilst I'm just kind of uh, letting Michelle catch her breath, um, if you want to kind of add some questions in, um, then, then feel free um, to do so. Um, real kind of big thing that and you, you've kind of wrapped it up nicely there at the end is one thing which i uh, always wrote down as probably the third or fourth thing which is you can do all the analysis but if you don't get the environment correct then then it's then it's worthless uh, almost uh, and that almost comes back to you, you mentioned in, in 2003 or 2004 where the emphasis on your process was working with the coaches and giving that ownership back to the players how much do you think that uh, kind of presenting that pathway from, from 2003, 2004 has kind of guided your views on how analysis should be um, throughout the kind of in, uh, long journey that you've taken? Yeah, I think it comes back to the reality that I cannot go on the field. Apart from the fact that I'm not talented enough to, I can't go on the field. So I feel that I'm failing in my job if I haven't equipped the players to be better players through what I'm doing. I'm, I'm wasting their time and I'm wasting my time. Okay. And then in terms of kind of linking your analysis, is it obviously you've touched on the, the kind of game plan do you, do you kind of construct the game plan with the players and the coaches before then fit the analysis? Or does the analysis kind of come first, which then informs the game plan uh, in, in both the kind of seven I, setup and, and your other kind of experiences? Yeah, um, I think initially we've started from the, um, the coach has 
very much designed the game plan and that's how it started and that's how I came in. Um, but I think now we're moving to make it far more fluid. Uh, I think you have to have a starting point. Um, and unfortunately that, well, fortunately that lands with the coach. But I think as you start developing your relationships with your players and your support staff, then you can start going forward in a far more dynamic way. There's, there's quite often times when I've seen something that happened on the field and I've actually gone and spoken to the, the strength and conditioning or the physio. I've not spoken to the coach. Because if I don't get their feedback, Doc, that's a really good way of going forward, then there's no point in me taking to the coach. If we don't have the players that are conditioned and um, injury free, then there's, there's no point in me going to him with my ideas. So it's a very, it's a very holistic and dynamic approach, um, and that certainly suits sevens because the the number of people involved is a lot smaller. Um, I haven't had that experience with the fifteens yet, um, just because um, I'm so new to the to the job with them. Okay, no, perfect, and. And kind of linking to to that in terms of that holistic and almost multidisciplinary process, how um, kind of now you're you're going to be starting in this kind of 15s role with, with the squad. What do you think the kind of key role that you play as an analyst and a, and a data kind of holder that you play in, in maybe are answering some questions or, or even posing some questions to those other members of the staff? Well, certainly, um, I've had lots of discussion with the, the coach um, because he's been at our training sessions. You know, we've had we've got a very fluid relationship between the sevens and the fifteens of the women. So quite often, both coaches are at the training session. Um, so he, he's listened a lot to um, how I've presented things, and he's uh, he's very happy that I approach from a different perspective. He says that he doesn't want someone in the squad that tells him what he already knows. He wants someone to tell him something different. So how my role will change, um, I've got to start building up a relationship with the players um, so that I can start hitting their, their feedback at the right level that they will embrace. And I, it's going to be a lot more complex just simply because the group size is a lot bigger. So whilst I've got a lot of information, um, and a lot of um, data on their game. I don't know how much of it I can actually bring at the moment because if they don't trust me and I can't communicate with them, then it's really irrelevant. So it is forming that relationship whereby um, we can work together and they can see that I've got the best interests of them and the team in mind even if I have to present hard information to them. Yeah, no, that's, that's really, really kind of key in terms of understanding um, the group of players and where they are. So like you said, um, I think when we were chatting on Tuesday, um, like some people haven't been on a, on a plane before, uh, haven't even been on, on the pitch and, and played a full game of 15s or 7s and they're in, in the squad because of the, the resources and, and player availability that you've got. Um, so that's that's something really uh, to kind of consider and, and links to um, how you go about the filming aspect as well uh, in terms that yeah once you probably the the senior senior men's almost adopt a more of a, a bird's eye view and a wide angle view to their their processes but actually with the, those younger players or those new to the squad actually trying to capture a perspective that's relevant to them from a from a floor almost level is probably actually more meaningful and that, that kind of yeah it was interesting and made me think in terms of what teams kind of do and whether that's something that's similar or, or different um because that's kind of different from what i've kind of experienced in that sense um yeah no yeah it's just another thing to uh I don't know whether it's to further complicate, but it's just to illustrate this, that we've got 11 different languages in our country, 11 official different languages. So I almost need to be able to provide feedback that is non-verbal because you're not sure whether a player is nodding their head because that's what they think you're expecting of them 
or whether that's because they've understood. And it can be as simple as they don't understand my English and my accent well enough to get the information across. So that's a, that's another way you've got to completely go back and make sure that the video footage that you're gathering builds trust. And so you've got to understand what, what all of that, um, you, know, you you've got to make sure that it communicates to them in, in their language. Yeah, and I guess guess kind of linked onto that is, is why almost there's that emphasis heavily on, on themselves um, in terms of being able to demonstrate that they kind of understand the, those key messages and are involved massively in, in that process. Um, when I was just, when you kind of flicked up your um, kind of weekly schedules and things, that you were saying that almost that Monday kind of morning had a, a player player kind of meeting which was outlining the the aims and objectives uh, for them to kind of complete uh, in that week. Does that influence what the the content of some of those video those sessions those video sessions may be, or is it already kind of descriptive between yourselves and the coach? No, the whole thing is completely dynamic. Um, we can have sessions planned out at the beginning of the week and we can get to the end of the Monday and Monday is completely different to how we plan it. The key is we have a limited number of resources if you want to refer to the players as resources. And if for some reason you've got a stomach bug that goes through the, the team, if you've got something else, um, a lot of the players are doing a secondary study as well, so if they've got exams. So almost from a Monday morning, we don't know how far we're gonna get with our program. It has to be taken day by day, almost session by session. Um, so I say to my, my son in the morning, listen boy, I'm not gonna be able to collect you from school this morning. And then at the afternoon, he's like, mom, what are you doing here? It's like, well, our session got canceled. So that, that applies to everything. Uh, so the video session, we've got X, Y, and Z that we wanted to do at the beginning, and we've had to adjust it because we've had an absolutely fantastic training session, and the players need to see the visuals so that they can have uh, be reinforced in their amazing achievements, or the reverse way around. So it's it's completely fluid. Oh, brilliant! And and um, just one last thing from, from me in terms of before I kind of ask or ask some of the questions that have been posed in the chat. In terms of almost linking with um, your kind of the sevens structure and lead up to, to a tournament, obviously you kind of touched on that a little bit. What's your kind of the pre-match the pre -match or what's the work that goes in that you do in the lead up? So um, I think I'll, again on, on kind of Tuesday when we had a bit of a chat, you mentioned that you only really find out about the draw and who you actually got a couple of days beforehand and, and kind of how do you over how do you assist in preparing those players with those key bits of information okay so the the easiest scenario to speak to is, is cape town in our preparation that we had there we had video footage from october which was the glendale tournament and we had footage um, from the dubai tournament now, I had to get those databases. I didn't know which team um, I had to prepare for, but I had to get all of the information so that as soon as the coach knew who we were going to be playing, that information was at his fingertips. So how we prepare in the week beforehand is very much we focus on our achievables, uh, especially in an environment that we haven't had uh, recent experience of. So with the, the, sevens, um, the seven series, we could only concentrate on ourselves because we didn't have the experience to be able to prepare um, for those those teams that we were going to be facing in Cape Town. The Africa Cup was very different because we had played those opposition many times before. And so we had a, a vast library of footage. And so we could go into a lot more detail. Um, you know, one of the teams that we were facing didn't have anyone that could step. They had a lot of speed. Those were, you know, the, the sort of things we were faced with. So how do we, how do we exploit um, their?
their lack of um, stepping ability, but compensate for their, their speed. You know, how do we form our defensive lines and those sort of things. So I think it really depends on the tournaments that we're going into and the background that we have. Um, so I certainly feel that the preparation that we did for Cape Town with the resources that we had available was fantastic. And the difference between the, the teams basically comes from the speed of decision making, which you can't really train for unless you've gone through a situation of the same. So I think, you know, next time we play at that level, we'll be much better equipped because we'd have realized our speed of decision making needs to be tested dramatically during training sessions. So how do we go about setting up those sort of sessions? So we've, we've learned dramatically our processes are, are not wrong. We just need to get more experience playing under the much greater pressure. So okay. I think, you know, those are the sort of things we've taken. Yeah, and that, that kind of almost leads on to your, the, the potential research or kind of avenue that you're wanting to then, then focus on and, and link in terms of look at those teams that qualify for the, for the series yeah. or from a from a, uh, an Olympic, but then to almost drop out straight away is probably or potentially related to what you just said that that pressurized environment, having that regular contact and exposure. Um, so no, that's really interesting. Um, just to kind of uh, finish up, I think we've got about three or four or four questions. Um, and just to kind of kick off, Stephanie's kind of mentioned about what's it almost like for you as a, as a female um, working within the, those male with those male athletes and that male dominated environment of rugby during those initial initial years and, and how did, how's that kind of how did you find that how's that affected your kind of your journey and your processes that you, you do as an amateur? sure um well working in south african rugby specifically the guys are extremely respectful uh, the only thing that you've got to change your mindset to is that they're not being chauvinist they're being respectful towards you. Um, so it's very different from the, the British kind of culture that I grew up with, where you, you've kind of got to fight your own battles. Um, so, you know, silly things, we went uh, white water rafting one afternoon and the bus driver wouldn't let any of the guys back on the bus until I'd finished getting changed. So I had that respect and privacy and the guys are always there um, looking out for you. Um, so if you can accept that they're not being chauvinistic and they are genuinely caring for you, um, it, it's your shift of mindset. And how's that prepared me? Um, I think it's given me a realization that I'm not gonna fight a rugby analysis with rugby. I've got to create my own um, identity and doing that by understanding the game in a slightly different way. I'm not going to have a discussion with a coach saying your tactics are wrong, da 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 because that's not going to work. However, what I can do is I can say, listen, coach, I've seen this and this and this that complement what you're doing. However, there are also things in this environment that aren't working. So you, you, you have to choose how you, uh, how you fight your battle, how you create your identity, um, so that you're adding value to the system um, rather than becoming a threat. No, oh, perfect. And, and that kind of, yeah, it, re real kind of key message in terms of when you when you start and present your initial kind of overview and, and kind of history in terms of outlining that you didn't see yourself as wanting to become a coach but wanted to become an analyst and, and you had clear kind of clarity of your role um, and, and the, the tools and resources that you had and, and how you provided them to the to the coach and the players around them. So, so spot on. Um, then kind of looking at, uh, at almost Rowan's and Gemma's kind of uh, questions and um, I've, I've got my, my views on both of these in terms of the, from, from Rowan's perspective, what, why do you think there's a lack of performance analysis research that looks specifically into um, best practice and explores ways in, in which kind of clubs uh, or teams are actually using performance analysis. Why do you think there's a lack of kind of research or willingness to, to share ideas? I think a lot of it's caught up with ego. I think if you, um, if you get to speak to the bunch of 
a call them guys at the bunch of analysts in the room that I showed you before. We want to share. We we just you know we've got your pat your back and all of those sort of things. We are, we're really happy to. But as soon as we walk out that analyst door, we can't do that. So I think I think you've you've got to realise as an analyst that as much as you want to to share. Um, and as much as you understand that the same environment cannot be reproduced in a different team because all of the dynamics are different, you've also got to respect the, the coaching environment that you're working in. Um, and if you do not have the trust of the coaches that you're working with, you, you can't go forward. So I, I would suggest that a lot of the reason that things are limited um, is, first of all, a time factor. You know, to, to actually be able to support a team properly and generate research is, well, I, I'm not sure that there are that people that can actually do that on a long-term basis because of the amount of time. And a lot of then is due to you have to respect the environment that you're working with. And if the coaches say, no, this is not how it's done, then you've got to find that boundary so that um, you get their respect, but you can also have a chat with your um, your peers about you know sort of more general topics of um, improving analysis. Yeah, no, no, spot on, and I think that's yeah similar kind of view, view, views to myself in terms of understanding the, the almost micro politics and, and power dynamics across not just those coaches but almost the wider organisation or stance um, in, in which you're kind of involved in, which kind of links to, to Gemma's kind of question is that. Have you had any kind of uh, situations in the past where where some of your ideas and data that you're wanting to kind of get published has almost be, been stopped by South Africa Rugby or anything uh, or kind of any challenges in, in that process? Um, I would say no, it hasn't. But the reason has been is that up until this uh, beginning of this year, I've been independent. I've been um, either self-employed or employed by the University of Cape Town, and all of the information I've been able to gather has been purely um, not owned by ETA Rugby. My process going forward, I would say I've got to go through a lot more, um, a lot more people before I can get research published, um, and it's got to be a lot more generalised. Um, so I think that's, that's been the, the benefit that I've had is I've only just started working full time with a team rather than a coach as a consultant. No, yeah, and, and that's kind of an interesting, um, interesting kind of yeah perspective and and challenge that we or, or some of the people on here who are kind of academics or, or pure kind of lecturers with a little bit of um, applied experience. Um, versus those, those who are predominantly applied, perhaps that kind of intersect and, and feel that, from my view, better kind of collaborations between organisations and clubs can, can hopefully aid uh, that process and hopefully kind of almost touch on, on Rowan's kind of point in, and hopefully sharing some of this knowledge um, through through making it anonymous, making it secure and and in some ways making it generalizable but not losing too much of that meaning um, whereby organizations or clubs kind of get a bit uh, a bit reluctant and, and not wanting to share some of those ideas um, and then just kind of one kind of final question obviously we're, we're kind of in in lockdown at the moment as um, as I'm sure sure you are as well how do you see that kind of affecting um, the global kind of rugby rugby landscape. Um, what kind of issues have, have South Africa had, and how what's the kind of impact on the sevens, for example? Sure. That's, um, from the information that's been in the media here, um, I think it's going to have drastic changes um, in terms of the where teams are playing. Um, I'm not saying whether I agree with it or not. I'm just saying that um, I think things are going to be shaken up dramatically. Um, we've got to create a, a brand of sport that 
investors want to buy into. Um, and we certainly had it when the money was available. Now we're in a situation where the money's not available. Um, so we have got to be extremely creative with the resources that we do have. Um, and I think it's going to be a huge challenge. Um, I'm certainly, I'm amazingly blessed by the way that SA Rugby have handled this situation, especially when you look at the way that Australia and New Zealand have. Um, I still have a, a, a guaranteed job for the length of my contract, um, whereas there are a lot of other people that, that don't. So, so far, I can just say that things are going to dr drastically change, but I don't think that's going to be a bad thing. Okay, no, good. Yes, and I think we'll kind of kind of wrap it up there, um, Michelle. I'm just conscious of, of, of the time as well, and obviously um, kept you kept you for from the rest of your evening. Um, so thank you for everyone who who's listened. Um, thank you very much, Michelle, for your for your time. Some really kind of interesting and insightful perspectives to take away from compared to a. Uh, almost a, a different culture that sometimes we from a from a west or from a Europe, european um, society don't fully understand and acknowledge and some of the challenges that you, you you face on a on a daily basis so thank you very much for sharing those insights um, fascinating for myself and um, hopefully speak to you soon so thank thanks you very, very much john and please if anyone wants to contact me my details are there or john has them so Thank you for your time, everyone. Thank you very much.